Good evening and welcome to the Dill Center's virtual learning series. I am Amy Reddick, the Birth to Preschool Professional Development Specialist at the Dill Center. Good evening, everyone. I'm Cheryl Cooper-Smith, the Kindergarten to Third Grade Professional Development Specialist at the Dill Center. This is the next session in our learning series on the science of reading. These learning opportunities are designed to take you on a science of a reading journey with experts from around the country. Throughout this year, we will explore topics around oral language development, phonological processing system, orthography, morphology, fluency, comprehension, and reading difficulties. Our goal is to share how science has proven the brain learns to read and provide you with methods, strategies, and resources that translate that scientific theory into evidence-based practice. Our mission is to enhance educator knowledge, improve classroom instruction, and ultimately increase student achievement. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Our team will monitor the chat box, so please feel free to type questions and comments in the chat. We will hold questions for the presenter until the end of the session, for discussion during our Q&A. And any technical questions for the team, we will respond directly in the chat box. And also, just remember this is a recorded session. Please be reminded the Dill Center is now offering continuing education units for attending professional learning events. And all attendees are eligible for CEU credit. However, there are a few conditions that must be met in order to receive these credits. So to receive the CEU credit, a survey must be completed and submitted at the end of each event, and more information will be provided after the learning session, so stay tuned. All right. Happy February to everyone. As you know, February is Black History Month, a special time to celebrate historical contributions to reflect on issues of inclusion and the effects of the civil rights and human rights on the future here in the US and worldwide. Among these descriptors, we found a common thread that echoes the call of equitable access for all. As eloquently stated by Dr. Nicole Patton, from the Florida Center for Reading Research, education remains the best chances we have for a more equitable and just society, especially for the most vulnerable among us. Reading literacy remains paramount. Inspired by these principles, the Deal Center supports the International Literacy Association, also known as ILA's global campaign launched in 2018, which embodies similar beliefs around the goal of literacy for our young citizens. Entitled, The Children's Rights to Read, ILA developed a list of 10 rights that every child deserves. In accordance with these rights, as literacy educators, we are responsible for delivering on the promise inherent in these rights. So let's take some time to hear from the children about these rights. Yes, and I have the right to read for fun. I have the right to read for fun. I have the right to read for fun. I have the right to share what I read with children all over the world. 
நான் வாசிப்பதை பற்றி பேசுவதற்கான உரிமை எனக்கு இருக்கின்றது Ես ունեմ իրավունք հիրովին ներկայացնելու այն ինչ զգում եմ կարդալիս։ These are my rights. My rights. My rights. My rights. What can you do to protect me? The Deal Center believes literacy changes lives, and we pledge to support the ILA in this campaign to, and I quote, enact these rights in classrooms and schools, and to work with others to ensure the same in homes, communities, governments, and societies. That's an end of a quote. At the end of this evening session, we will provide you with additional information and resources to join us in this worldwide effort in literacy for all. Thank you, Cheryl. It is my privilege to introduce tonight's guest, Dr. Pam Kastner. Dr. Kastner is an educational consultant at the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistant Network also known as Patton, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where she serves as the state lead consultant for literacy. Dr. Kastner currently co-leads Pennsylvania's dyslexia screening and early, liter in early literacy intervention pilot program. In addition, she is part of a research team investigating the impact of explicit instruction and advanced phonemic awareness on student literacy outcomes. She has served in a number of leadership capacities at the district level and served as a Pennsylvania Distinguished Educator for the Department of Education. She is a National Letters Trainer and Certified Reading Specialist. Dr. Kastner also has the honor of serving as the President of the Reading League Pennsylvania and as the moderator for the Science of Reading, What I Should Have Learned in College Facebook page. So without further delay, I would like to welcome Dr. Pam Kastner. Thank you so much for the honor of spending time with me this evening. Um, it's just wonderful and such an honor to be here for the Deal Center tonight. Um, let's get started. It's going to be a busy night. Okay, so thank you again, uh, Amy, for sharing a bit about my uh, background. Um, I am the uh, State Lead for Literacy at Patton. I do have the honor of serving as the president of the Reading League Pennsylvania. But probably my greatest honor is uh, being a grandparent. <laughs> For those of you <laughs> out there who are a grandparent, I, you probably truly understand that. I do have six amazing, wonderful grandchildren. Their names are Lola, Leila, Mio, Lily, Louie, <laughs> and then the street breaker, Daphne. So they range in age from 11 to um, six months. So it's just such an honor to be their grandparent, but also to be so engaged with literacy. So thanks for being here tonight. All right, so let's talk about the roadmap for this evening. This is going to give you an overview of how our evening will proceed. We're gonna start out with the theoretical frameworks that underpin the science of reading. And that's always where I start. Uh, we won't be able to spend a tremendous amount of time there, but it's truly important to understand the theoretical frameworks that underpin uh, the science of reading so that we can move forward um, in evidence-informed ways. Then we're going to, of course, dive into phonological and phonemic awareness. And then we'll speak about some non-negotiables. What are some things that are absolutely essential that are really gonna amplify your instruction and phonemic awareness? We'll briefly touch on assessment. And I have many, many <laughs> free resources to share with you uh, so that you can take this learning from this evening and, and translate it into practice. Um, all the resources I share this evening, as well as many others will be uh, shared with you on a Padlet, which is a resource for curating um, uh, resources so that you can um, engage with them after this presentation. Okay, so let's start out with the theoretical frameworks. Um, could you give uh, Cheryl and um, Amy a thumbs up if you're familiar with this theoretical framework? I see a lot of esteemed folks. I see university folks. I saw folks in the Rollins Center, so I'm assuming that this is probably um, 
a theoretical framework you're familiar with, yes? What are you seeing out there, Amy and Cheryl? Let's see. Oops. Uh, I see a thumbs up. Okay, well, good. Oh, well, I see a lot of thumbs up. Oh, All wonderful. right. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful. Yes. Well, this is a theoretical framework that we typically begin with. Uh, it is called the simple view of reading, but of course we know that reading is a very complex skill. But Goff and Tunner in 1986 determined that there are two main um, domains that impact reading comprehension. Of course, one being word recognition. Uh, are, can students read words accurately and automatically when they uh, come to them in print? And do they know then, once they've decoded them, what those words mean, the language comprehension? And what I want you to notice is that this is not, you know, this is a literacy training, but we're focusing here um, on some math for a moment. This is a multiplication problem. You see that times uh, in between the word recognition and language comprehension to equal reading comprehension. And really what this is telling us is that we need both. So if we have a student, and I bet you can think of students that you've had who may be accurate and automatic at reading words, uh, but when they're done reading what they've uh, decoded, they don't know what it means. So we might assign them a one uh, for word recognition and perhaps a zero for language comprehension. So maybe in the chat, you can tell me what is one times zero? <laughs> I bet you're getting lots of zeros there, right, Amy and Sharon? <laughs> That's right. I see some zeros, lots of zeros so, coming up. So they're good at math too. So there you go. All and right. <laughs> On the converse side, of course, uh, we know students who, when they are orally um, chatting with us, um, or if we're orally um, sharing a read aloud story, and we ask for a retail, that they have very good language, good syntax, good background knowledge, but when they themselves are trying to read and print, they struggle mightily. So in this case, we might have a one for language comprehension, and then a zero um, for word recognition. And so again, zero times one is, and I'm sure you're seeing lots of zeros there. Yeah. So it's really just a, a, to really Lots focus zero. <laughs> good mm -hmm. to focus us on uh, how important both of these domains are to skilled reading with comprehension in print. And the other theoretical framework that we always kind of bring to the surface is Scarborough's reading rope. And I'm sure if you knew the simple view of reading, you certainly know this framework as well. Um, Hollis Scarborough actually created this rope for parents to help parents understand how complex and multifaceted uh, reading is. And so what you're going to notice is that we have a direct alignment between uh, Goff and Tumner's simple view of reading and Hollis Scarborough's reading rope. At the bottom of her rope, you see three components that comprise skilled word recognition. And the one we're going to focus on a lot tonight is this phonological awareness, the ability to be aware of the sounds and language and larger language units, phonological sensitivity, perhaps at the syllable and onset rhyme level, but getting down to that phoneme, that individual sounds in words, that ability to do so. Of course, um, we know that it's absolutely essential to be uh, skilled in phonological awareness and an alphabetic language, but we want uh, students to be able to map those speech sounds onto print uh, or graphemes and letter patterns so that they can decode words. Um, and then a sight recognition is one that Dave Kilpatrick and Linnea Airy has really brought to our attention a sight word is any word we can read as if by sight, we're putting no um, phonic decoding into it. And uh, in order to do so, you have to have real good uh, phonological awareness and great decoding skills mapping those um, to one another. That's what builds that sight recognition through an orthographic ma mapping process. So we don't have time to go into this deeply, but usually when I um, talk about the rope, what I do is I have pipe cleaners, and then we talk about how these are braided together. Do you see how in the rope, these three um, skills are braided together very tightly. And maybe someone in the chat, um, can, why is it so important that these be braided together? Since we have such an esteemed group here. And we're gonna get a little clue there on the slide. What do you see in Amy and Cheryl? All right. I don't see any takers so okay. far. <laughs> okay, so these three skills need to be accurate and automatic I know we can think of kids who can decode, they are accurate, but they're slow in doing so. So by the time they get to the end of the passage or the sentence, they uh, cannot remember what they've decoded. So these skills must be accurate and automatic. You'll see that um, arrow there at the bottom. 
right? So what happens if a child is having problems with word recognition? This is what the rope is doing. It's pointing us in the direction for where there might be a problem, right? So we'll talk later about diagnostics, but whenever a child is having word recognition issues, this is kind of pointing the way to where uh, there might be issues. Maybe one of these uh, strands is not strong enough or it's frayed in some manner and it's going to impact word recognition. So when we think about these theoretical frameworks, not only do they inform um, the, the component parts that are part of skilled reading, but they also inform our instruction, our intervention and the materials and resources that we engage in. So uh, just as in the simple view of reading, um, is it enough to be a skilled at reading words accurately and automatically? Um, it is not. <laughs> we need to also be able to um, know what those words mean. And that's the upper parts of the rope. There are five components uh, of the upper part of the rope. Uh, background knowledge, if this is word knowledge, our background knowledge is world knowledge. What do we know about the world and what can we bring to print that we read about our background knowledge? Vocabulary course is about understanding the meanings of the words that we're decoding. Language structures is our grammar, understanding the syntax and structure of our language. Verbal reasoning is all about inferencing and those idioms and similes and metaphors that we uh, encounter in text. And then of course, knowing the different uh, genres of uh, text, uh, fables, fairy tales, <laughs> eventually biographies, memoirs, things like that. Knowing how they navigate is really important in helping us read text and bring meaning to those. The skills at the top are, oops, we have a little background there, are um, we need to become increasingly, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a bunch of, there's a lot of background knowledge. Yes, I'm just seeing that we're getting from background. That's coming from, but in any event, the top uh, parts of the row become increasingly strategic, right? These are skills. Okay, I'm sorry. Was it, did you lose me there for a little bit, Cheryl? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I think we are here talking about the top parts of the rope. I want uh, everyone to think about maybe perhaps a book that they've read more than once. Um, are you the same reader when you come back to it? Probably not. You have more background knowledge, more vocabulary. Perhaps you're better at understanding the sentence structure of the text that you're reading. So you're becoming increasingly strategic and these skills are um, engaged over the, our entire lives. All right, so these two parts, again, just like the simple view, have to be braided together uh, to be a skilled reader, right? And this happens over time. And um, of all the theoretical frameworks, I have to say that um, Scarborough's Rope is my favorite. Um, it is my favorite because I think it's very tangible and it's a wonderful way to explain the complexity of skilled reading to parents um, and educators in a very tangible way. Um, as you're sitting down talking about um, student interventions, instruction, intervention, materials that you're purchasing, maybe schedules that you're working on, I always have the rope right beside us uh, when we're working with school teams because um, these theor theoretical frameworks are really living, breathing uh, resources for us as we think about the work that we're doing with children. Yeah. And um, Dr. Kastner, I saw some uh -huh. really good responses in the chat box. So oh, awesome. I saw Jill said develops automaticity when we see the, the um, strengthening of the ropes. Um, Anna said how to support kids with special needs. Oh, I love um, that's that. That's one Thank of her you. questions, and we'll get to that. And then um, connection leads to automaticity. Awesome. Wonderful, wonderful responses. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. I, I do really want this to be back and forth. Okay, so thank you. I do think it's important to kind of ground ourselves in uh, theoretical frameworks because they really do inform everything that we do or they should. So thank you for allowing me to take the time to do that. All right, so go to the next slide. All right, so um, again, briefly touching here, um, I love this quote from Louisa Motes. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Dr. Motes, who is um, an extremely well-regarded researcher and literacy expert, international literacy expert. She is the author as well of letters. Um, but I love what Louisa Motes says about teaching reading. She says, reading and writing depend on language. If you know this, then you will become a teacher of language, not just a teacher of reading and writing. And she's absolutely right. Reading is a linguistic skill, 
and we need to be focusing on all the systems of language. And I wanted to point out, of course, that we're really honing in here this evening on phonology, the rule system within a language by which phonemes can be sequenced and combined and produced to make words, right? And we're gonna spend a lot of time there tonight, but I also just wanted to just briefly highlight that the uh, systems of language, all of them are essential to be teaching to students. Um, so we, we couldn't just hone in on here on phonology um, in our instruction overall and have skilled reading, but phonology is an absolutely essential critical language skill for students to have to read in an alphabetic language like ours. All right, so this section is a focus on what is uh, phonological and phonemic awareness. Uh, again, a brief overview, we could spend a whole semester or, or more talking about phonemic awareness and phonological awareness, but we're gonna focus on why it's important and just a bit on the research findings, all right? Because we wanna spend some time in the how. So whenever you see, I don't know why this is, I, I, I guess I should find the original source, but whenever you begin to talk about phonological awareness and you look at images, we always see this umbrella. <laughs> and I don't know why that is, but it is a good, I guess, analogy to talk about the um, subset and overarching um, skills of this, this, this linguistic skill. So phonological awareness, that larger umbrella term, is this phonological sensitivity and our awareness of our language, our um, written lang or our spoken language system in syllables, onset rhymes, or individual phonemes. And when we get to the phoneme level, of course, we're talking about phonemic awareness. It's when we're aware of the individual sounds in spoken words, right? So it's much more precise in this overarching um, understanding of larger uh, sound units, language units like words, syllables, onset, and rhyme. It is more about the individual sounds that we hear within words or we analyze within words. And it's absolutely essential, as I said, in an alphabetic language. Uh, what we have done when we created our alphabet is basically we have created graphemes and graphemes are letter or letter patterns or letter clusters that represent phonemes, the speech sounds of our language, right? So when we created an alphabet, we created an alphabet to represent speech. Um, Louisa Motes uh, and her uh, uh, seminal text, which just the third edition, um, speech to print. So when we teach, we need to be teaching from speech to print. That's how our students learn to read. And it's certainly where they um, begin to spell. They begin by sounding it out with speech. Right, so phonological awareness, again, is this overarching umbrella um, term to uh, discuss the ability for students to analyze um, syllables, compound words, onsets and rhymes. And we'll talk about uh, what that means in just a moment. But phoneme awareness is an awareness of the individual speech sounds of our language. All right, so um, what makes this so hard? <laughs> Uh, years and years ago, um, Dr. Marilyn Adams wrote um, this article, The Elusive Phoneme, um, and of course it still is true today. Uh, it's because we don't attend to the sounds of phonemes when we listen to speech. So I'm talking to you quite a bit, but my language is coming out as co-articulated co streams of phonemes. And the focus really is for you to pay attention to the meaning, right? Um, but when we're teaching phonemic awareness, it's a very abstract concept to kids. Um, we need to help them become aware that we, when we say the word, for example, sat, um, yes, it's coming out as these co-articulated or sometimes Dr. Motes calls them smushed sounds all uh, one after the other, but, but so quickly, yes. But they had to become aware that the word sat is comprised of three phonemes or three individual sounds. And those phonemes are s, uh, and t. So it's a very nebulous, abstract thing for kids to um, determine this because we don't talk like this. <laughs> we don't break our speech sounds, our words into individual speech sounds. But if students are going to learn to read and write in an alphabetic system, that's exactly what they need to become aware of. And also we're gonna find out from Dave Kilpatrick's research, they need to become proficient as well that we need to go beyond uh, awareness to proficiency, all right? So why is this so important? Um, as you can see on the slide, um, students who have reading challenges, not all, but the vast majority of students who have a um, reading challenge and a spelling challenge especially, um, they have some type of phonemic awareness 
um, challenge. I don't really want to say deficit. Maybe it's that it hasn't been taught yet. But in any event, the phonemic awareness is profoundly impacts students' ability to read and write in an alphabetic system. Of course, when we are um, decoding, right, we see a word, it comes in through our eyes, of course, uh, which can sometimes fool us, but it's a linguistic event when we're reading. We see the graphemes, the letter and letter clusters. We look at them in a sequence and then we bring pronunciation to it. So it's critically important for students to be able to understand um, that words are made up of individual speech sounds and they're represented by graphemes. Um, so uh, what you see on the slide here is some research, uh, research findings, but I think it's always more fun <laughs> for you to be engaged with this as well. So I'm going to just kind of do a closed procedure, and I know it's going to maybe sound messy, but I think it's important um, to have you um, engage and participate as well. So I'm going to read uh, the text that's in the white part and um, just unmute, or if you don't feel uncomfortable unmuting, just uh, you can say it <laughs> where you are um, and not unmute, but you're going to read either out loud or wherever you are, um, the parts in the light blue, okay? So I'll, I'll pause and I'll, I'll wait for you. Here we go. Faced with an alphabetic script, and I hope you're reading or saying the child's level of phonemic awareness on entering school may be the single most powerful determinant of the success that she or he will experience in learning to read. And I'm sure you're saying where you are in the likelihood of that she or he will fail. Okay. And next one. Uh, measures of school children's ability to attend to and manipulate phonemes strongly correlate with their reading success all the way through the 12th grade. Those are two really powerful um, statements about phonological and phonemic awareness. And I really want you to look at the slide and see when they were made. And you can see it was 1990, right? And it's now 2021. So here's the thing about phonological and phonemic awareness. We've known for decades how essential it is and how profoundly it impacts the ability to read and to spell. But I really want you to notice down here all the way through but look at that correlation, which means a relationship between all the way through 12th grade, okay? So this is just a quick research roundup. I didn't wanna talk at you with more research. I just want you to uh, look at the screen. These are four um, other statements that are really critical uh, in terms of the research. Which one resonates with you? One, two, or three? And then uh, maybe we'll just ask maybe somebody if they'd be willing to share out, but you're gonna put it in the chat. Okay, and then Cheryl and Amy are going to tell me what they see. So, so far I see ones. Okay. For Virginia, she had a one, one resonated with her. Elizabeth, two. I see a three. Lots of threes. Someone, <laughs> okay. I saw an all. I saw an all. Yes. <laughs> like Lots that. of threes, twos. There's you. a couple more ones. Uh -huh. Awesome. Three twos and four twos in a, in a row. They all really resonate with they me too. They all resonate I across all. the board. I That's think it's right. a tie. I think it's a tie. A okay, no, tie. no clear winner. <laughs> um, so would anyone who chose one just be willing to kind of just unmute and say, um, you know, I chose one and here's why. It would be nice to have a little chat. Let me make sure that they can. And if you're, if you're shy, it's okay. <laughs> okay. So... My name is Virginia, um, Hi, Virginia, and I chose one. It does resonate with me because being a children's librarian, I have families of all ages who come in and seeing them during the developmental stages struggle with this. Mm -hmm. You can over time see how it affects their development all the way 
um, through high school because mm -hmm. they're constantly behind on their reading levels. We're, you know, we're constantly working with the families to get them ahead. Um, and, and we're looking for new ways to support that, which is why I'm taking this because it, the, the child's development of this word level reading is affected by this and it, it can just begin to compound over time. You, Virginia, thank you so much for unmuting and sharing that. You're absolutely correct. We do need to get the kids as early as possible, first by really effective core instruction, right, at tier one, so that we're teaching these uh, skills in very effective ways, um, because we have to close that gap. Because, Virginia, I'm sure you would agree with me, because I can tell that you're so passionate in your voice, that this is not only an academic um, concern, it's also a social, emotional heartbreaking concern for kids when they have to come to school every day and they have challenges reading, um, how, um, how challenging that part is too. It, it's not just academics. It profoundly impacts a child's uh, feelings about their own self-worth. Yes, so thank it, you. Yeah. it mm -hmm. does. It really does. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, would someone be brave who uh, chose number two? Hi, this is Betsy. Hi, Hi Betsy. Betsy. Hello, Betsy. Hi, y'all. <laughs> um, I chose two because um, as a previous kindergarten teacher, my children that could not, um, I, I don't even want to say deletion, but just substitute letters or delete and, and learn the chunks. They just had a hard time when, when it was, um, when we started going from just sounds to the printed word. Um, they just kind of stayed in that at the decoding piece of every single word. And, um, but the children that could manipulate the sounds and just the spoken word um, had, a, had a better time when we transferred over from sound to print. So mm -hmm. I just felt like that was a huge, um, that was a huge skill. It is. And this is from Gail Gillen's book, which she released again in 2018. And you're right. Um, there's this reciprocity. I want you to think about maybe a coin, right? There's two sides of a coin. We have speech and then we have print and they are uh, interdependent. Yes, they both contribute to uh, skilled reading and spelling, but they're interdependent, right? And we begin with speech because that's where we began when we uh, created that um, alphabet. We began with speech and we created symbols to make speech permanent. But look here, you know, as I said, at this deletion skill, say bus without the b at five and six, it significantly predicts variation of reading at nine years of age. So it's showing that there's a causal, there's a correlation and a causal relationship on whether kids can do these advanced phonemic awareness skills because deletion is an advanced phonemic awareness skill that we'll talk about all the way um, into third, uh, third grade that we're seeing there's this relationship. So again, oh gosh, you um, early educators, um, and for anyone who's working with kids who has reading challenges, uh, phonemic awareness is so important. The great thing is it's so much fun to do. The kids love doing it. And when it's done effectively, you don't have to spend inordinate amounts of time doing so. You do have to be very explicit and you have to know how to error correct, but the kids love doing it. Okay, um, anyone choose number three? And we do still have some background, I'm so sorry. Um, anyone choose number three? Which I heard a lot of people did, <laughs> so. And would be um, brave. Three was pretty popular. I know, I remember that, Cheryl. <laughs> oh, so you might have to, they might have to fight each other off to respond. Right. <laughs> so. I'll share. Hello, everyone. My name is Whitney. Um, Hi, Whitney. Hi, Thank Whitney. You. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. So I didn't choose number three. I chose number two. I was going back and forth with myself. <laughs> <laughs> but when I read number three, it really tugged at my heartstrings because I immediately wondered, well, then if 88% of dyslexic population struggle with the same thing, is it that the child is dyslexic or is that attributed to a teacher's lack of understanding for how to correctly teach um, phonological awareness? So I was just wondering that. Yeah, dyslexia um, is a um, word uh, reading challenge and most students who do have, again, it's a generalization, uh, not all students, but they um, have a phonological core deficit and they have other things going on as well. Think back to that rope. 
Um, but of course, that means, of course, that we need to directly and explicitly teach it, right? That's the important part. And the good thing about, as I said, phonemic awareness is all students benefit. Um, some kids, it's absolutely essential that you be teaching phonemic awareness. All kids will benefit from it, though, because oftentimes as teachers, we hear like, well, you know, that's, you know, the kids that are, um, you know, uh, uh, gifted or who are reading this will not benefit them. And that's absolutely not true. All students will benefit from um, phonemic awareness, especially moving students to those advanced levels of phonemic proficiency. So, so thank you. I really, truly appreciate your participation and your feedback to the three who um, jumped in as, as well as all the others who put in the chat, but what um, resonated with you. All right, so when we think about phonological awareness, uh, we look to the work of, um, again, um, Linnea Airy is a main researcher, but also I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, David Kilpatrick's Essentials of Assessing, Preventing, and Overcoming Reading Difficulties. This book came out in 2015 and pretty much it set the literacy, literacy world on fire. Uh, so I will be referencing um, his uh, work as well as Linnea Aries. But uh, we talk about phonological awareness through these three levels, okay? Um, and uh, they are early, basic, and advanced, right? And so you could be any age of person. It's not um, age specific, and you could be in any one of these levels um, with uh, your phonological awareness skills, all right? So when we think about early phonological awareness, and remember I said it's almost as like this phonological sensitivity, it's this um, ability to be aware of rhymes. Of course, first be aware of what rhymes are, uh, words that sound the same at the end. Um, and then eventually the ability to produce those uh, rhyming words, which is a much more challenging skill. Um, alliteration um, is back to those wonderful nursery rhymes. Uh, she sells, she sells down by the seashore <laughs> or Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Um, we are beginning with the same initial sound and we are placing it in every word that follows. We're becoming aware now of these um, beginning sounds. Um, again, in early, we're thinking about syllables. Remember I said, um, when they're in these early levels, they are becoming aware of larger linguistic uh, units. So that would be the syllable. Um, so for example, if I said the word table, and then we would chop it into the syllables, table, right? The syllable is, uh, um, the nucleus of a syllable is the vowel sound. Um, and then being aware of the first sound. Um, when if I would say the word, as I said to you earlier, sat, you would say, oh, the first sound I hear is s. All right, so we're moving in the early into these individual uh, phonemes, the individual sounds in a word, uh, but it's the first sound, of course, which is the easiest um, for students to hear because it's, a, it's at the beginning. Uh, when we move into basic, we are blending and segmenting phonemes. And uh, we'll uh, go into that just a bit more. But of course, we always want to begin with um, continuous sounds. And we're going to learn a lot more about sounds and phonemes tonight. So a continuous sound is a sound that you can hold on to until you would run out of breath and pass out. So for example, I would want to start my blending with um, a consonant vowel or a vowel consonant that had a um, continuous sound. So for example, on a consonant vowel, uh, much easier for kids to blend than we, when we have stop sounds that we're going to talk about. Uh, uh, the flip side of blending is segmenting. So if I said so, and then it asked you what sounds do you hear, let's break it up. And the sounds we hear would be so. Oh. All right. So you started by um, an early um, attending to the initial sound or the first sound in a word. Um, in basic phonemic awareness, we're attending to next the final sound. So in the word sat, um, we would tune in and analyze the ending phoneme t, and then we would move to the vowel, the medial sound at, and we would ask, what sound do you hear in the middle? And they would say, ah, all right? So for the most part, when we think about our assessments, our universal screeners, they've really uh, focused right here, phoneme segmentation fluency, right? And our universal screeners. Um, Dave Kilpatrick, in his um, book, as well as Linnea's Aries work, has really um, talked to us about moving beyond phonemic awareness to phonemic proficiency. And proficiency is profoundly different than um, awareness. When you're aware, you're consciously thinking of those speech sounds. But when you're um, manipulating these speech sounds, you have to do so in a very accurate, automatic, and proficient way. And we'll have some examples um, just a little bit later. 
So again, uh, deletion, substitution, and reversal are the skills for advanced uh, phonemic awareness that moves us into that phonemic proficiency. And what you're going to notice is it goes again from these um, easier uh, to the more challenging, right? So whenever you're looking at um, curricula that is aligned to teaching phonological awareness, you want to see a logical scope and sequence from least complex to most complex. And we're going to look at what that might uh, look like. Um, in your handouts also, um, this was provided, this is the scope and sequence from um, the Hegarty curriculum, which many uh, folks are using to teach phonological awareness. But what you're gonna notice, of course, that it begins uh, with the least complex and moves to most complex through each of these skills, rhyming, um, onsets, uh, final and medial, uh, blending, uh, segmenting, adding, uh, deleting and substituting. So again, when you're looking at materials that you're teaching students with, you want to look for this logical scope and sequence. All right, so we're gonna do a little bit of this. Um, okay, so we're gonna start with early. So again, we talked about rhyming. So here's the thing with rhyming. Um, I'm gonna ask you to put in the chat, um, do your kids, because maybe this is just happening in Pennsylvania, but do your kids have problems with rhyming? Uh, producing rhyming words, I guess I should say. When you um, would do a closed procedure, if you said, oh, my word is sat, can you give me a word that rhymes with sat? Are you having problems with that in Georgia or is it just Pennsylvania? So I see here, uh, Ashley said, yes, many of her pre-K students have problems with it. Jill said, yes, hers do too. Yeah. Kayla, yes, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Karen said, yes, especially her ELs. Yes. Uh, Kyla said kindergarten, yes, there's problems there. Uh, Joy said, yes, many children have difficulty. Um, yep. so so it's not just said, Pennsylvania. <laughs> right. She said her son, oh, it moved. <laughs> Assumed, <laughs> her son, this is the area where he has some difficulty too. Um, my son was a reader, but he struggled with it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so I, I guess it's not just Pennsylvania. So we're going to talk about why that might be, right? And also we're going to talk about um, the influence or the, predict, the variability that rhyming has in skilled reading and how um, should we spend our time there or should we be moving on to that phoneme? So when we think about rhyming initially, we, we just want to tune kids' ears into can they hear? Like, um, hat and cat are rhyming words. Rhyming words are words that sound the same at the end, of course. We want to you know, define what it is and give examples, right? And then have the kids repeat. So uh, one um, overarching recommendation I'll have for you whenever you're doing phonological awareness is you want the phonological form, whether it be a compound word, a syllable, an onset, a phoneme, you want that in the kid's mouth. If you're giving a prompt, you want them to repeat initially when you're starting instruction because you want to make sure that they have heard you accurately and you want the word form, the phonological form in their mouth too. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is the ones doing the work are the ones doing the learning, right? So um, sometimes as teachers, we work harder than our students, right? So we start out by telling them what rhyming words are, and then we need to move to recognition. So let me just go through like a scope and sequence, and we'll talk about what it might look like. So I begin by telling students what rhyming words are, and then, um, then I provide, um, I have that word forms back in their mouth too, so they're saying them. So then I might say, I'm going to say two words that... If the words rhyme, give me a thumbs up if they do not give me a thumbs down. Ready, listen, sap, rap. Then they would repeat, sap, rap. And then they would show me whether they rhyme or they don't. So I guess out there you probably have your what? I hope you have your thumbs up. <laughs> so whenever I'm uh, doing this with uh, teachers and kids too, I always make sure that I do a show me signal because um, if I don't have a think time and then kids responding at the same time, what happens is uh, kids start looking around to their friends and they're looking at what they're doing with their thumbs, right? So when I am um, asking for a response from students, I want to give think time. Think time is very important, but I also want them responding at the same time. So some of my teachers will um, have kids put their thumbs at their chest. One teacher, first grade teacher that I work with, she has her kids kind of put their arms out like this and they put their hands at neutral. She'll do a rhyming uh, pair or a non-example and the kids either thumbs down or thumbs up. And then she asked them to go right back to neutral because she wants formative information back on her kids. She wants to know who is getting this and who's not. So when we're engaged in um, whole group instruction, these ways for students to respond are really important because they're giving the teacher information back 
about um, error correction, right? Or whether they can move on, all right? So um, I might then move to something like this, rhyme recognition. Which words rhyme with lid? Listen, did, said. Repeat, did, said. But of course, I want the kids to say, okay, everybody respond, and they should, be, they should say did, right? But here's the thing, kids are needing to hold that phonological information. They're listening to the word that I've um, prompted with, then they have to listen to the series of the words, and then they have to make a decision, right? So there's a lot of phonological working memory going on. And by that, I mean, they're having to hold on to a lot of phonological information like you do maybe when you're learning a new phone number, right? You do a lot of repeating. Um, so that you can retain that, right? Uh, I could go up to three words. I'm going to say three words, so listen carefully and re repeat back to me only the two words that rhyme. Are you ready? And you can put it in the chat. Fell, tell, box. And I hope you're saying fell, tell, box. What are the two that rhyme? I bet you're seeing fell and tell in that chat box, zero and in. Yes, lots of <laughs> fell and tell. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, now here's where our kids really have the challenge. They have a challenge with rhyme production, all right? So I'm going to start with a nonsense word, and you, I know this is an oral uh, practice, but you're going to put it in the chat in orthography or written. I'm sorry about that. But let's say I have a word. I say my word is um, sat. Give me any word that rhymes with sat. It can be a real word or a nonsense word. I see hat, bat, mat, cat, mat, cat, bat, awesome. <laughs> rat, awesome. chat, nonsense word, gat. <laughs> there you go. So when we're doing this, when we're asking students to produce, whenever we're asking them to produce something, that's a much higher skill, all right? So you're asking them to generate a new word. So if it's a real word, I want you to think back to the rope. Yes, they're pulling on their phonological awareness skills in order to do so, but what else are they um, pulling on? What else are they needing to use in order to generate that word? And I hope you're thinking language comprehension. They have to have that word in their receptive and expressive language, right? So it's so hard, you're asking kids to pull on two areas where they're having to think about the phonological and phonemic aspects actually that are happening with this word when we're producing a rhyming word, but you also have to have that word in your receptive and expressive language to produce it. That's a lot of work going on mentally for kids to do. And it's actually, we're gonna get, talk about advanced phonemic awareness. It truly is in a substitution skill in many respects, because I said sat and you said hat, I heard that. So you're substituting the initial phoneme and mapping in a new word. That is an advanced phonemic awareness skill. Yeah. And that is Pam Kastner's <laughs> hypothesis for why this is so difficult for kids to do, because you're truly, you're thinking that, oh gosh, you know, when we get to rhyme production, I'm still in rhyme and that's an early phonological awareness skill. But truly when you're asking them to produce, you are asking them to substitute and you're also asking them to pull on the language, the receptive and expressive language. Right. Dr. Kastner, I saw a uh -huh. quick question. Okay. Um, does it count if they give you a made up word? If they give made up words, does it count? Uh, um, it, it does if you say it does in the sense that um, <laughs> I don't mean that to be, you know, facetious. I just mean if you say like, give me any word, it can be a real or nonsense word. Of course it counts. And it is easier for kids to give you a nonsense word. Because if they say, if you say hat and they can say, I don't know, blat, that's not really a word, or do you understand what I'm saying? They can kind of just mm -hmm. peel off that initial sound and just throw anything in there that they might know. Any phoneme is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them for a real word, you're asking a much more challenging skill. You truly are, because now they have to think about, oh, I have to change that phoneme to a, a phoneme that makes a real word. And I also have to have that real word in my phonological lexicon and my semantic lexicon. I have to have it in my receptive and ex expressive language. And that goes right coincides with some of the other comments around prior knowledge and vocabulary, listening right. skills, right. and so on. That's what I mean. That's why I always have to share the rope and the simple view. No matter what training you're ever in with me, I, I just can't not do it because these things are at play all the time, whether you're a new novice learner or you're a skilled reader, 
think about you if you've ever read something that is um, unusual to you. Um, uh, my brother-in-law is a dean of biology. I always read his research when he visits. I can decode those words for the most part, uh, accurately and automatically. Some of them I have to chunk up a little bit with the syllables, but I don't bring any meaning to it. I don't bring comprehension to it because I don't have anything, I don't have any of the upper parts of the rope or not a lot of them, right? I don't have the background knowledge. Um, I, the syntax is a little bit different. I don't have the vocabulary for some of the terms. So this is, I want you to think about you as a reader or a child as a reader. We're always having these um, word recognition and language comprehension um, things, you know, back to my, you know, pipe cleaner, they're always happening, all right? Mm -hmm. So the other thing I want to tell you about rhyming is don't get stuck here, especially if you have a student who's uh, beginning kindergarten. Um, the research strongly supports that we need to get kids, you know, as soon as we can to the phoneme level. The phoneme level is where the magic happens in terms of mapping sound to print. Uh, Dr. Motes has written a wonderful article uh, that had a question about do children need to master rhyming before they go on to phonemes? And it's a very brief article. I put it on the Padlet so you have it, but the answer is no, right? Okay, so um, we're talking about rhyming. Rhyming uh, loses its predictability is what I'm saying in terms of its ability to project how students are gonna read. Remember back to that student in kindergarten, that one um, quote was a student who was in, who's five or six who can't say bus without the b. Um, it has impact all the way to um, age nine, right? So the phoneme is where um, it, it really happens. So yes, of course, you might continue working on some rhyming, but you're not going to spend your instructional time there. You need to move to the phoneme. All right. So in this phase as well, when we talk about segmenting words into syllables, of course, we're not going to start with alligator. <laughs> we're going to start with two syllable words, three syllable words, four syllable words, right? So let me, I'm going to show you some hand movements because we're going to be using, looking at them in a lesson later so you can see. So I might say my word is um, um, kitchen and say my word is kitchen kitchen and you guys would say kitchen back and then I would chop it up. Now I'm hoping you're seeing it go left to right because I'm going to write right to left. Kitch, kitchen, right? So we're doing two syllables before we would go caterpillar, right? So again, a logical scope and sequence. We're beginning with two syllable words and we're asking kids to chunk them up, um, then three syllable and four syllable, right? So we're asking them to attend to larger and larger amounts, hold on to in phonological working memory um, more right, because they're going to need to attend to the phonemes, but we started this phonological sensitivity where they're looking at syllables and segmenting. Um, remember onset fluency is when we are listening for the first sound in a word, that might be an onset rhyme, so in my word that I've been sharing with you a lot tonight, sat, the s is the onset, it's the consonant that precedes, or the consonants, depending on the word, uh, precedes the vowel and what comes after it, so it's the onset and at at is the rhyme, the R I M E. All right. So this is all early phonological awareness. This is really uh, the purview of pre K teachers, right? Because when uh, kids get to kindergarten, you know, um, you know, they're starting to peel off the initial sound and in that alliteration. But we really need to get kids to be isolating the first sound and then moving into the final sound and the medial sound. Here's the thing about phonemic awareness. Students need to pay attention to the phonemic sequence all the way through the word, you know, all the way through all the sounds, right? Because they're going to map graphemes, letter and letter clusters, onto those sounds. So I bet if you're a first grade or second grade teacher, you see kids who write the word jump and they forget the mmm, right? You need to go back to the phoneme level and tap it out, j, a, mm, they need to be analyzing all the way through the word. They're dropping out the sound when they're spelling. And if you aren't analyzing that sound, you won't be spelling that sound, right? So when we think about basic phonemic awareness, again, we start at the um, initial sound, then we move to the final sound, and then we're moving to the medial sound. We're making kids increasingly aware of the internal structure of the word, right? The uh, phonemic structure all the way through the word because uh, Louisa Motes calls them parking spots. These phonemes are like, I guess like, a, should have a little car, but these parking spots, they're holding a parking, the phoneme is holding this place on which will map a letter or letter pattern, a grapheme, right? And if students are not analyzing those speech sounds, they won't be able to read that word or spell that word 
accurately because this is laying down. I oftentimes will do this like um, Velcro, right? <laughs> you know, this is the phonological highway. If it's laying down this sequence of sounds that students need to pay attention to and then what we map letters and letter patterns so we can read and we can spell. But we begin with speech. Right? So we'll begin aware of the initial sounds, move to final sound, then the, uh, the internal structure, the medial sound, and we blend and we segment. Right? This is where we've lived for many, many years in terms of teaching phonemic awareness. This is why our universal screeners, this is where they stop. Right? So um, I will point out to you that when we do so, when we start with blending and segmenting, and we'll talk about these speech sounds just a bit, we want to begin with continuous sounds, like a VC or a CV. And then we move to more complex blending and segmenting. So I might start out with uh, blending at, you would blend it together and you would say at, and then that's a VC, and I move to a CV, so, and you blend it together and say so, CVC, at, and you blend it together for a, the word sat, right? So a vowel consonant, a consonant vowel, a consonant vowel consonant, then a consonant consonant vowel consonant. There's a, again, I want you to think about these things as a scope and sequence from least complex to most complex. Oftentimes when I'm visiting a school and students are at the basic um, level for phonemic awareness, a teacher will say, um, they can't blend a CVC. So I'll say, well, tell me about the CVCs that you're asking kids to blend. They're like, well, cat and dog. So I want you to uh, listen when I say the sounds for cat and dog, k, at, and d, uh, g. Now I'm going to say another CVC, sun. Which one's going to be easier for a student to blend? Sun or dog and cat? And I hope you can put that in the chat and Cheryl and Amy can tell me what they're seeing. Easier to see blend. a lot of suns. <laughs> Yeah, why is that? Anyone want to un, un, uh, mute and just say, like, why is that? Because they can hold on to that S sound until they move to the next sound. Yes, because they're continuous sounds and they can hold on to them. And, you know, remember I said phonemes are elusive? A k at is a lot more elusive than a s. Um, but here's the thing we as teachers need to know that, right? Because um, what we know influences how we teach. Um, and I'll say, oh, uh, you know, true confessions here. <laughs> you know, um, no one taught me this in college, right? Um, and I know, you know, it's probably not just in Pennsylvania, right? So it's so important that we understand our language system because when I share with, uh, you know, teachers the speech sounds of our language and their features, and then they begin with a continuous sound like so um, or son before they go to cat and dog, all of a sudden their kids can blend these CVCs, right? They just needed a, a very intentional, explicit scope and sequence and a teacher who had that knowledge, right? Um, okay, so then when we get to advanced phonemic awareness, um, this really is um, been brought to our attention, as I said, from David Kilpatrick, um, his book pretty, like I said, set the world on fire. Um, and he talked about the need to, do, to manipulate phonemes so that, um, we were engaged in developing proficiency, not just awareness, because you have to be aware of sounds, phonemes, which is really important. Uh, for instance, in sat, you need to be aware that there are sat three phonemes, and those are the phonemes. But to become proficient, you need to be able to be accurate and automatic with those phonemic sequences um, at the unconscious level. Think about any skill that you're really good at. Um, I hope you're really good at driving. <laughs> But I'll bet you have driven somewhere and arrived at your location and thought, how did I get here? Yeah, I hope I'm not the only one. Sometimes I'll end up saying, gosh, you know, gosh, that's, how did I get here? I didn't even think about you know, the turn signals and the gas and the brake and everything else that I was doing. I had automatized it. I was proficient. I didn't have to put any cognitive desk space into it at all. That's what our kids need to be that's the level that they need to be aware of or unaware of when they are manipulating phonemes, that they're so aware that they're unaware, right? And so when we uh, move to these advanced phonemic awareness skills of deletion, substitution, and reversal, um, that's how we are helping them, all right? 
So let me just try a couple with you, deletion. Okay, here we go. We're gonna go back to sun. <laughs> uh, say sun, repeat sun. Now say sun, but don't say s. And what we have left is what? Sun, I hope you said that. Um, say map, I hope you're saying map. Say map, but don't say mm. And I hope you're saying app, right? So you notice I'm beginning with uh, continuous sounds, right? Yeah, I'll tell you, it, get, it can get continually tricky, right? And more advanced. So let's try one that's a little bit harder. Say slack. Now say slack, but don't say oh. Okay, I hope you're saying sack, right? So deleting that uh, uh, second sound in a blend, very, very hard, right? Um, back to substitution, right? Um, so when I'm doing my deleting before, I could say, say slack, and I'll say slack, but don't say, oh, what's left is sack, right? Substitution, one of the hand motions is this kind of back and forth. So let's do one together, right? So put your hands out like this, right? And what these hand motions are doing is they're representing speech sounds. They're making those elusive phonemes concrete representational, right? They're representing these phonemes. So say mip, mip change mm to s by where it is. And I hope you're saying sip, all right? So we're gonna talk about those underlying skills here in just a minute. And here's a fun one to do, say park. And I'll say the first sound as the last sound and the last sound as the first sound. And I hope you're saying carp instead of, a, sometimes folks will say things that are not that, all right? So why advanced phonemic awareness, right? So when we said mip, when I said MIP, change M to S, that was a substitution, advanced phonemic awareness skill. So this is an iceberg. This is the tip of the iceberg. This is the skill we were focusing on substitution, right? Tell me what you were doing underneath the surface uh, to come up with that answer. You were engaged in other phonemic awareness skills. Tell me what you were engaged in. What else, was, what else did you need to do to do that? What's the first thing you needed to do? Okay, so the first thing you needed to do was you needed to segment that word, right? I'm asking you to change something. So you need to segment out, out the word and then you had to isolate. Where did she ask me to change or substitute the sound? When I ask you to isolate in the initial position, which is the easiest. So you segmented, you isolated. Now, what did you have to do? Somebody put uh, something in the chat. If not, I'll just move forward. Okay, you had to delete. You had to take out the mm. You had to add or substitute in the s. And then you had to blend it. And um, I want to, did anybody think about that? Put a yes or a no when you were doing that. Were you thinking about all those sub skills that you were doing? Yes or no? I saw mostly no's. So yeah. one or two, yes. Too many steps. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you did them just like that, right? Right, With, automatic. Without even <laughs> automatic. So see, do you see the difference between- Someone me? said it was automatic, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. So do you see the difference between me saying sat and asking you to segment and blend or blend that uh, word, right? Or saying sat and asking you to blend or sat and asking you to segment, you need to be aware. But when you went from MIP to SIP, you were proficient. You were aware of the speech sounds, the order of those speech sounds, and you were able to manipulate those speech sounds and you didn't think about it. That's proficiency. And that's where we need to get our kids if we want to help them map those speech sounds onto print, right? So here's the difference between uh, awareness and proficiency. You're aware of all those sounds and you're not even aware, right? You're uh, proficient. Um, unconscious access to every phoneme, that's what you did, in every position of that spoken word. Um, and and it's, these skills are not adequately addressed in a uh, segmentation task. Um, and if you're, if you're thinking about it, it's not proficient. All right, so why is this important? Remember I said, um, if we go back to um, my Velcro here, this um, phonological system, language system is laying down this um, highway with these parking spots, as Louisa Motz would said, to map 
graphemes, letter and letter clusters, right? And so what's the relationship between the two? So in the early phase of um, phonological awareness, it's helping kids learn their letter names and their letter sounds, the two biggest predictors in those early grades to skilled reading kindergarten. Um, blending and segmenting is helping kids to phonically decode, right? Um, and blend and sound out unfamiliar words. But these advanced skills that move through manipulation are helping kids orthographically map or map these uh, phoneme sequences to graphemes in the particular phonemic sequence and the letter sequence so that they become glued and stored uh, right back here in our visual word form area. Um, so it, it is mapping these, the sound and the print together so that these words can be stored in that exact same sequence phonologically and orthographically. So the word eventually through repeated exposure becomes as if by sight. But we don't get to that sight word vocabulary without these underlying skills of mapping sound and print. All right, so there's this reciprocity between the two. All right, so you've been, um, you've been sitting for a while, probably. I don't want you to have to sit forever. So let's do some fun things and um, have you engage in maybe standing up and sitting down. Because phonemic awareness, of course, is all at the oral level. When the minute you put print with for any of these skills, it's phonics. So phonemic awareness, all auditory, manipulating these sounds and becoming aware of them. But when we add graphemes, letters and letter clusters, it becomes phonics. And sometimes, you know, we get mixed up with our terms. So it's really important that we understand what is phonemic awareness and what is phonics. So you don't have, I don't, I think most of you have your camera off so no one will know, but let's do a little bit of stand up, sit down. All right. So I'm just going to um, talk about some instructional strategies. And if, you, if they are phonemic awareness, I want you to stand up. And if they are um, phonics, I want you to sit down. All right. So here we go. What is the beginning sound you hear in the word giant? So I hope you're standing up because that's a phonemic awareness, right? Beginning sound. What letter makes the, the mm sound? And I hope you're sitting down because um, that's phonics. We brought a letter in there. How many sounds are in the word truck? I hope you're standing up because that's phonemic awareness. Um, do the words light. Oh, I'm sorry, Cheryl. We, I was just saying we got some responses coming through on okay. the chat. <laughs> yeah, it's, we, we sit too much anywhere with Zoom, so I wanted so to get Fanica you a little bit. and Whitney are right on point. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, do the words light and fight rhyme? I bet you're standing. <laughs> what two letters make the sound? And I hope you're sitting, right? you got letters in there, right? Change the I in chip to ah. What word? And that's when you make awareness. And the spelling E makes a long E sound. And so as soon as we're talking spelling, it's fine. So you're probably sitting down again. I'm right. giving our participants a hundred. I yes, saw a lot of, a lot of yes. really good responses. Okay. Oh, awesome. Thank you for participating Thanks. in the chat. Yay. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. So here's the thing. You can have the best uh, curriculum uh, for teaching phonemic awareness, and I hope that you do. But there are some non-negotiables. And gosh, you know, as uh, Amy told you, I've been uh, part of a research team that's been studying advanced phonemic awareness. Uh, we wrote an IES grant for $3 million to scale that study. We'll find out um, next month if that's been approved. But in any event, um, I've had such an honor of being in schools and working with uh, teachers across our wonderful state and really seeing what are some things that make the difference to really improving phonemic awareness. So these are my non-negotiables um, if you really want to amplify your outcomes, all right? So I always say, repeat after me, <laughs> you don't have to unmute, but there is no magic bullet. There is no magic bullet. <laughs> Teachers teach kids, not programs. Sometimes in education, uh, we're always looking for like, oh, if we get this, if we get this one thing, it's just gonna, you know, it'll fix everything. Um, and honestly, it's the teacher. If there is any magic bullet at all, and I'm not really saying that there is, but the closest thing that we're gonna get to that is a knowledgeable and skilled teacher. Teachers teach kids, not programs. 
because even if your program is not as ideal as we would like and aligned with science of reading as we would like, a teacher with knowledge can make up for that. Um, but even if we have a good program, um, if we don't have skilled teachers, we're not going to get the same outcomes that we do when we have them together, all right? So we've been talking about this a lot. Um, I've been modeling it for you um, throughout our time together. We need to teach um, from least complex to most complex, right? From simple to complex. And so this is just a summary, really, of what I've been talking to you about since we started, right? That we, of course, oral language is a foundation of all, right? And then we're moving through these phonological sensitivity, these early phonological, phonological awareness skills, and we're moving up into these early um, basic phonological skills where we're blending and segmenting, right? But then we're moving up to those advanced skills where we're manipulating here, right? So whatever your um, curriculum is and your instruction is, I really encourage you to look at the scope and sequence and see if it's moving from least complex to most complex. And it should mirror um, this kind of stair step from simple to complex, right? The other thing I want you to look for is does it give kids enough practice? Sometimes I really feel there's a practice gap where we may introduce something and all of a sudden we move on, right? So good curricula gives a lot of practice, distributed in cumulative practice. And it also, um, as I said, goes from the least complex to most complex and lots of opportunities for kids to practice. Uh, why is that so important? Number one, for you as a teacher, it's giving you so many opportunities to see formatively where your students are with those skills and error correct, right? And we're good at the things that we practice, but we also need feedback about that practice. And that's that error correction. So look to see what your curriculum looks like, right? The other thing we're going to spend a little bit of time on is the speech sounds of the English language. Um, you cannot be skilled at teaching phonemic awareness if you don't know how to teach the speech sounds of English. There's just no way around it. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the phonemes of our language and their two classifications, consonants and vowels, and how to articulate and make those speech sounds. Okay. So before we start uh, going into this section, could you put in the chat box, and I'm sure you're all going to get this answer correct, how many speech sounds in the English language? How many phonemes in our English language? And Sherwin and um, Amy can tell me how. I'm sure you're all putting that number in there. But I'm sure you're I'm seeing see. lots of 44, 44, yay! 44. Yay, yay, yay. Yes. Dr. Dr. Jean would say, kiss your brain. <laughs> so kiss your brain. Right? Yes. So there, there are 44 <laughs> speech sounds. How many of those are consonants? Put that in the chat. How many consonant sounds? So I know we have 44. How many are consonants and how many are? Well, we'll start with consonants. How are we doing? I see 24. We're close. From Alicia. Yeah. yeah, very, very close. Okay, well, let's find out. All right, let's find out how many consonant sounds there are in the English language and briefly, very, very briefly, talk about how to enunciate them. I cannot uh, express enough how essential it is for uh, we as teachers to um, accurately and cons consistently model pronunciation of the sounds correctly. Uh, because if we schwa, uh, we add that uh to uh, the speech sounds uh, of our language, guess what our kids will do? They will schwa. If we schwa, they schwa. And I know one of the schools I work with actually got me a t-shirt that sh said schwa happens, <laughs> and it absolutely does. But we really want to be aware of how we're articulating the speech sounds because what we express out of our mouth will come out our pen. So when your kids might be writing bat and they're writing B B U A T. It's because um, they are pronouncing the b uh, phoneme with a b. So whatever comes out here is going to come out that pen, all right? So, um, so uh, this the awareness, the speech sounds for kids are um, speech sounds, of course, but they're also articulatory gestures, right? And so this is a pretty heady <laughs> statement. Uh, it facilitates the activation of graphophonemic connections. And what we mean that by that graphophonemic, grapho meaning like the letters, the written system of our language, the graphemes and the phonemes, right? So it's activating this, this uh, relationship between speech and print and print and speech, right? It's a two-way highway, right? And it's securing them in memory. And we want to make sure that we're doing that in a good way. So letters has graciously allowed me to use um, and share their um, consonant um, chart. And this is a consonant chart from um, letters, and it's talking about place. 
and manner of articulation of our speech um, sounds for consonants, right? So when we think about place, um, I could put my mouth <laughs> kind of like this way, it's whether the sound is happening in the front, middle, or back of our um, mouth, right? In this back part. So I bet you're guessing that for the sounds that are made in the front of the mouth, like p and b, easier for kids because they can see them and feel them here, but maybe sounds like they're in the back of our throat, like k and g, much more challenging for kids. So when we think about the um, phonemes, uh, consonant phonemes of our language, we think about place, where in our mouth is happening. This is the front and the middle and the back. And then the manner, what, what's happening with our uh, mouth, lips, teeth, tongue, and our vocal cords, right? And I, I'm here to tell you that kids can learn these things and they learn them well. Um, and it helps them to become better um, spellers and certainly better readers as well. So we're going to spend a very little amount of time here. I wish I... I had more time with you for this because this is such an important part, but I'm going to talk to you in very brief about these speech sounds, how to articulate them. I want you, wherever you are, you probably don't have a mirror handy like I do, but you probably have a phone because I want you to look at um, what's happening in your mouth. And we're going to talk about our vocal cords too. And we're kind of went missing here for, for a second. All right, so um, stop sounds, very uh, quick burst of air. Oh, there's my mirror, right? They're going to. Um, they're going to have a quick burst of air and they're going to stop. That's why they're called stop sounds. And I think you'll notice that they have unvoice and voice partners, right? So we're going to put our lips together and I'm going to model the uh, unvoiced uh, lips together sound for the graphing P. Watch me. Put your hand here when you're doing it on your throat. Now I want you to turn your voice box on. Right? So we have these. Uh, partners. These are stop sound because it's a quick burst of air and the, the uh, breath stops. So these two are minimal pairs. That means they are uh, similar and their articulatory gestures, what's happening with our mouth, our lips, our teeth, our tongue. Uh, uh, but, you know, one is voiced, the b, and one is unvoiced. Here's what happens. Oftentimes kids will spell um, a p with a b or a b with a p. And it's a voicing error. They're either turning their voice box on or they're uh, not turning it on when they should. All right, we're gonna put our tongue on the ridge behind our teeth. We're gonna do the t and the d. Watch me, t, d. All right, I hope that you're doing that as well. And then remember I said front, middle, back. Now we're going to the back of our throat, the k and the g. All right, so these are stop sounds. They have a quick burst of air um, and um, then they stop. So would these be good sounds to start blending with? Yes or no, put it in the chat. And then Amy and Cheryl can tell me what you're seeing. I'm seeing lots of no. Oh, yay. No. Yes, these would not be good ones to start with because the sound stops. Um, and that phoneme is even more elusive. Now we're gonna Fantastic, move on to the Fantastic, everyone. Oh, yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, next we're going to the nasal sounds, and that's because the airflow is going directly through our nose. You know, when you get a cold, you sound so, fu you sound so funny. <laughs> that's because the airflow cannot go through our nose to make those sounds. Now, I'm going to put my lips together, and I'm going to make the sound for the grapheme M. Watch me, and you can do it wherever you are, too. Ready? Mm. What do you notice about that sound? Is it a stop sound, or does it continue? What do you see in the chat? I hope you're seeing it continues, right? The sound continues, right? Yeah. So I want, continue, I want you to hold continue. your nose. Yeah. Good. I want you to put, hold your nose when you make the sound for M again. Ready? Mm. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> you could not make that sound any longer, right? Yep. That's what Jill said. It continues until you hold your nose. <laughs> These are sounds usually when they are next to a vowel, like M or AM, or they get co-articulated or smooshed together. That's why the kids drop them out. Tongue on the ridge behind our teeth. Watch me for that sound for the graphing N. Mm -hmm. Right? That's a continuous sound. And then uh, at the back of my throat, mm, I can sing. Right? So anything that's in a row, or in a column, oftentimes kids will confuse, and you'll see that in their spelling when they're writing. 
Our fricative sounds have some friction. I'm gonna do them quick. Watch me, they're gonna have partners. My teeth are gonna be on my lips. We're gonna make the sound for the grapheme F. Um, one way it's spelled, ready? And now I'm gonna turn my voice box on. Mm. Whoops, oh my, that went fast. Sorry about that, I touched that. All right, so and mm. all right. Now the most attractive one that's coming up, it's too bad we're not <laughs> with partners. Um, we're gonna put our tongue between our teeth and we're gonna make the unvoiced sound for that graphing TH or the digraph TH and the voice, watch me. My voice box is turned off and now I'm gonna turn it on. Mm. Like in the word the, right? So um, when we have a sound wall, we're, usually where is the word the on a, on a, excuse me, on a word wall? Is it, where do we usually put the word the under, on, on a, a word wall? Usually we see it under the, the grapheme or the letter T, right? And we've told students that T says T. So when kids begin to write, they begin with speech. And that's why a sound wall could be really helpful to students, right? Because you're seeing sounds on our consonants that are not on a word wall, all right? Now, these two pairs, one will be voice and unvoice, the tongue on the ridge behind my teeth, and and are these continuous sounds or stop sounds? I hope everyone's saying continuous. Right, and then I'm gonna have my tongue put on the back on the roof of my mouth. Watch me, this is unvoice and voice partners. Shh, and zzz, like treasure, measure, genre. And at the glottis, we're all the way back. I'm seeing lots of continue, <laughs> continuous. Awesome, and we have, right? And this was just most recently moved to a fricative. Earlier I had them added down with the glides. All right, Africans have, um, they act like stop sounds and fricative because there's friction. Uh, any consonant has some obstruction to uh, producing them. Um, and we just have two. One is unvoiced, watch me, and then you can do it too. And then I'll do the voice partner. Ch and j. Ch and j. Right? Put those sounds. Our glides and our liquids, um, <laughs> they glide into. Uh, the vowels that precede them or follow them or the vowels that precede them. So they glide into, and that's why they're called glides and um, liquids. All right, so we'll go over those quickly. Now this was recently in the, the new letters uh, consonant chart, the WH unvoiced and the W were moved here to the glides. So the WH unvoiced is typically not said in the America. Now, if you were in Britain, possibly you would, you might say, whilst I go for tea. It's almost like a uh, sound, it's a whisper of a sound. But in uh, the United States, we mostly voice that and we say whale. So say whale for me and put your hand on your throat. Do you feel vibration? Whale. You're not saying it, whale. It's not that whispery sound, right? Um, our uh, tongue pulled on back on the roof of our mouth, the sound for why. And gosh, I've, um, I'm in a big conversation with our state leader um, speech around this sound because there are two ways that we've seen it um, pronounced uh, or articulated. Uh, one is y and the other is y. And so that's a big controversy right now. There's a lot of different um, examples out there. It's either y or y. And that y, y as in yellow, uh, makes it a continuous sound. And then our liquid sounds, uh, we're gonna put our tongue uh, on the ridge behind our teeth, ready? Make the sound for L, the grapheme L. Ooh. And then this, the hardest one to make of all is this R sound. It's not an er, it's almost like a little dog barking. Okay, so why is this important, right? Because if you are not articulating the speech sounds accurately, your kids will not, and it will show up in their writing. So it's so important where we're seeing such wonderful results with kids of phonemic awareness. Teachers have this knowledge and they're teaching it to kids, right? And then boy, our vowels. Um, we have, as we said, we have 18 vowel sounds in the lovely dreaded schwa. So I want you to look at my mouth. Ready? Well, as I make the vowel valley, it's in the vowel valley. So watch my mouth. I'm gonna go right down the left hand side of the vowel valley, and I want you to tell me what you see. E I A E A I A. What do you see? E, I, 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 I. 
your mouth gets wider. <laughs> yes, it does, right? Up here, I have this tight smiley. E -e 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 -i -a. Now watch me go back up. E -e 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 -i -a. Uh, uh, oh, uh, you, you, right? Closes up and rounds. What do you notice about the phoneme e and i? E and i. Are they in close and articulatory gesture? E, i, e, i. Anytime that a vowel is close and articulatory gesture, kids oftentimes will confuse them when they're spelling, right? Because they need a mirror. E, i. To see the difference between an e and an i, but look at the difference between an e and an ah, right? So remember, when we were teaching these, we want to teach those that are far apart in the valley so that they don't get confused. And we always want to be teaching them with our mirror. And your SLP, your speech language pathologist, should be your best, your BFF. Okay. So what might this look like in terms of transferring this phonemic awareness into print, into a sound wall? Up here, of course, we have our uh, consonant sounds, and we're mapping speech to print, right? And then here's our vowel valley. Of course, we have lots of ways we can spell our vowels, right? So we have this relationship, as I said before, between phonemes and graphemes, uh, but we begin with speech, all right? So um, it's really important that you make the speech sounds correctly, and it's easy to drift uh, when you're making them. So I saw the Rollins Center is on here this evening. I, I think I saw that. Um, I have your wonderful video of articulation um, on the Padlet. Here's another one. Um, again, this is on the Padlet, phonemes are sounds and articulatory gestures from the great blog Spellphabet. Um, the Owen Gillingham card deck is an invaluable tool. Of course, mirrors are important too, but this is a free app that you can download um, on the App Store. And it reviews um, graphemes, the name, the sound, so uh, what sound does that grapheme make? What's a keyword? And this is the keyword here, bat. And then there's a video of someone um, articulating that speech sound. Keywords are especially important because you want to make sure that they actually make the speech sound that they are saying that they do. Oftentimes in classrooms, I'll see xylophone for X. And we know X is two phonemes, or a box or a fox would be appropriate, or I see an egg, which sounds a lot more like an A than an E. So we're, uh, a keyword like echo or edge would be a much better choice. So keywords are truly important because kids are anchoring to those. This is another video that is on the Padlet to show you how to make those speech sounds. So I wanted to leave you with resources um, for how to make those speech sounds after our brief introduction tonight. All right. All right. So. Teach skills um, least complex to most complex. Teach those speech sounds of the English language. Model them correctly. And then, of course, we want to um, engage students in multi-sensory, um, multimodal ways for students to engage with um, these phonemes because they are elusive. But we want to use common language so that they're described the same way to kids. Oftentimes, our kids who are at risk, they have um, things explained to them one way in core, another way in tiered intervention, and maybe another way in an after-school program. So we want to make sure our language and our um, hand motions are the same. Dr. So Kastner, I, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to let everyone know we shared the Padlet link in the chat. Awesome. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Yay, there's so many resources on there for you. I hope you, you really um, take advantage of them. Okay, so we want to make sure our language is consistent. And if we're engaged in these hand motions, that they are consistent as well, that everyone is doing them the same way because we want common language and common instructional practices um, among all the folks who are engaging with our kids. This is a resource that was adapted from the work of uh, uh, Lisa Van Hecken to go through each of these uh, phonological and phonemic awareness skills to guide your language and to guide your hand motions. And then of course, usually what I put in this column is usually don't be careful not to schwa, right? So that is a resource for you. Right, because sometimes I found that teachers don't, um, it's hard for them to, de to describe the skill that they're going into. So it's good to have common language, again, and common um, hand motions. It doesn't necessarily matter what your hand motions are as long as everyone is doing them the same way. Um, I have some schools who've made up their own hand motions for things, it's fine with me, as long as everyone's doing it the same way so it, it keeps it consistent for kids, all right? 
So uh, Virginia Berninger talks about this as language by ear, language by eye, language by mouth, and language by hand. We need to have these multimodalities, these ways that uh, these neural pathways for kids to own these speech sounds so they can, again, of course, map them to graphemes. All right. So when we think about this, we think about it through three lenses. Concrete, representational, abstract. Remember I said, when I say, say MIP, change M mm to S, that's completely abstract. <laughs> Kids, you know, uh, as I said, phonemes are abstract and they are elusive. So some kids have to start here. They have to start with concrete. They have to start with objects. So for example, if you were uh, teaching perhaps a sound for t, you might wanna have them, they would hold a table because they actually have to hold something concrete to map that sound. And you can kind of see in this you know, image where students are mapping items that they've you know, concretely held onto and sorting them by their um, individual or initial phoneme, right? So maybe a student can't do this at the all oral level. We need to go backwards, right? So when we're, we move from concrete to representational. So for example, if I remember I said, my word is nip, I can say, mm, it, change mm to s, my word is sip. This is representational. I'm saying it and I'm moving it, but these chips are representing speech sounds right because kids may not be able to do it all orally right then we might move to a verbal with hand motion my word is nip change m to s. my word is sip right so i'm verbal and now i'm doing hand motions then i could say my word is nip change m to s. sip so students are doing it verbally and they're accurate but they're doing it in more than two seconds, right? And then I say my word is nip, change m to s, my word is sip, right? See this kind of scope and sequence? If a student is having a difficult time doing it here with hand motions, try going back to this representational where they're seeing it and they're saying it and they're moving it. They may need the scaffold, right? A temporary scaffold, we don't wanna, have scaffolds um, long term. Okay. okay, so this is, I think this is a really important slide in terms of thinking about um, if kids cannot do it auditorily, is it guiding you? Where do you go? How do you go back and find out where you can help kids? All right, so concrete representational abstract. And then, of course, daily instruction. You know, it only takes 10 to 12 minutes a day to do this. Um, it's a it's kids love doing it um, and if you do it well 10 to 12 minutes a day um, should do it right but we don't want to stop in uh, kindergarten we need to move to those upper grades all right so we're going to watch a little bit of this video i'm going to move it ahead a little just a tiny bit because i know we're getting closer to time but this um, patent um, where i work as i said we've been doing research on this for quite some time and we are very honored to work with teachers and who um, were kind enough to allow us to videotape their instruction all right and so um, on our YouTube channel, we have 26 videos of teachers teaching. So we're gonna watch a little bit of this. We're gonna debrief and I'm gonna share some resources with you and then and we will be out, okay? So here we go. Um, and technology was our friend in the beginning. So Cheryl and Amy, I'm really hoping that technology is our friend here too. So here we go. Tell me what you notice, all right? And we'll just watch a few minutes. We move it up just a tiny bit so you can see some of the phonological they started with the uh, card pack. Hopefully we'll move the buffer. Yeah, can we think of a different one? I'll come back. Diego. Nice. Avery. Brayden. Hamburger. Hamburger. Shoulder. 
So what she's doing there is giving a word and they're creating a rhyming Avery. word. Avery. Is older a real word? Like I'm getting older, right? Can you think of a different one? Brayden? Colder. Colder. Like clean. Okay, we're going to move up ahead. Just want to watch some onset fluency. Watch this. Oops, a little bit further ahead. There we go. Sore. Fling. Smooth. Trace. Drill. Crane. Okay, so what they're doing there is they're listening to a word that has a blend and they're peeling off the initial sound and they're punching it out. All right? What a good job. 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 All right, I'm gonna chop it up. You blend it together. Good. Ooh, a, mm, s, glance. B, er, a, mm, z, bronze. T, w, i, mm, twin. Ooh, a, mm, clump. D, er, s. Now what you're noticing is there she is, the students are beginning, given the individual sounds and they're blending it together, but they are doing that with, uh, with blends too. All right? You notice the hand motions for that, right? Uh, oh, that was fan, fan, fantastic. All right, I'm giving you three words. You're going to punch out the end sound. Here we go. Sleeve, have, live. Rich, such, lunch. Team, rhyme, king. Miss, pass, cups. Drop, black, slip. Oh, listen again. Drop, slap, drop, lap, slip. Okay. If, off, tough. Lick, sack, make. Cloth, path, both. Swish, push, cash. All right, warm them up. All right, chop up your word. Plenty. Ooh, a, mm, t, e. Yeah, segmentation. Substitution. Move a little bit ahead so you can see more of that. Past. Past. Change A to O. Post. Post. Good job. Is that a long or short O? Long. Good job. Green. Er. E. Mm. Change E to I. Er. I. Mm. Grin. Is that a long or short I? Short. Short. Shape. A. Change A to E. E. Sheep. Long or short E? Long. Trick. Tr ick. Change it to up. Tr uck. Truck. Is that a long or short U? Brave. Er A. D. Change A to I. Er I. D. Bride. Long or short I? Long. I. Do your I? It's a long one. You're right. Band. B. And. D. Change and to <laughs> et. Bend. Bend. Nice job. Is that long or short E? Short. Short E. Very good. Give me some fireworks for that. All right, friends. I'm going to give you the first sound, then I'm going to give you the rest of the word. Repeat the first sound. Okay, then we'll put the whole word together. B. B. Add O to the end. And, we'll, and the word is O. Add ask to the end. And the word is D. Add ice to the end, and the word is mm. Mm. Add eat to the end, and the word is eat. Add own to the end, and the word is own. Add ear to the end, and the word is ear. Good. Add eight to the end, and the word is eight. Er. Add each to the end, and the word is each. Add I to the end. 
the end and the word is what at all to the end and the word is Ooh, well Woo! all right last part friends i'm going to give you the whole word we're going to take away the end you tell me what's left pitch pitch without itch what's left more more without or what's left mm. light Light. Without it, what's left? Ooh. Take. Take. Without ache, what's left? Sing. Sing. Without ing, what's left? Goat. Goat. Without oat, what's left? Ooh. Car. Car. Without r, what's left? Dance. Dance. Without ants, what's left? Gem. 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 Without m, what's left? Gem. Known. Known. Without own, what's left? Ooh. Good job. I'm good stuff. I'm good stuff. You're good stuff too. You're good, good stuff too. Good job, boys and girls. Give yourself a round of applause. Okay. So, a, few, a couple minutes of talk, and then I'll go over the resources that are on the tablet for you. Um, but what did you notice about that? What are some things you noticed? Could you unmute and just chat a little bit, just for a couple minutes? It was such a quick flow to it. Like, it just really went very quickly. The kids stayed engaged the whole time. Yes. Yeah, so would you say these kids are moving, uh, they are phonemically aware or they're phonemically proficient? What do you think? They're proficient. They're proficient. They're, boy, they're just, now this is a week 22 lesson, all right? So the children were engaged in doing this five days a week. So 22 times five is 110. They've been engaged in moving towards this for 110 lessons, right? So you see how they're becoming so proficient and it's got this nice rhythm to it, right? And they Anything? went through so many skills. Yep. They practiced so much in such a short period. And uh, did they seem to be able to keep, was the teacher following the pace of the students or moving too quickly or just right? What would you think? Just right. Just right. That's right. And that's, I think this is the art too, when you're teaching for an awareness. Do you think this, uh, this class looked like this on day one? No way. All right, so <laughs> probably not. No, I think Stephanie, yeah, Stephanie is a great teacher, but uh, even on the first day, right? Um, right. So Dr. Kastner, one of our participants said they would love to see a video from day one and compare oh, it to I, this. <laughs> I, it, it, you know, honestly, I will tell you because I've been, like I told you, I've been engaged in this for, you know, several years now. I would tell you that typically by week three, if you're doing it every day, your kids are into a rhythm. Now, are they this automatic yet? No, but this is where we need to get kids. And she was doing this in 10 minutes a day. And this is when I say, aren't our kids worth 10 minutes a day, right? Yes, they are on such an important skill that has such an impact on their ability to read and spell. And are they having fun? Yes. Uh, in some of the classrooms, I know the one teacher called this the brain book and the kids, she got even a millisecond off the structure when she did that. You know, are we doing the brain book today, right? So. Our kids can do this. And what do you notice about her modeling of the speech sounds? Pretty good, huh? Clear and concise and a great perky pace. Yeah. Yes. And so they're developing a great processing rate themselves by functioning at that rate. Thank you for saying that, because that's so important, right? You remember the skills that we're good at were automatic. We don't even think about them. Those kids are proficient. They are building a reading brain that can wire those speech sounds to graphemes that will help them read and spell so they can focus on meaning and not decoding. And they're having fun doing it, right? Laura said, it's a, it's a wonderful to add movement to the skills as well. And did you like the little celebrations you did in between? I loved it. <laughs> yeah, isn't it awesome? It just kept them motivated all yeah. completely through. Now I worked with, uh, in this particular school district was where we did our research study. I had 40 uh, teachers that I was working with and um, part of our work was they got to see each other um, teach. It was so amazing. Teachers rarely get to see each other teach. And um, it was really cool to watch as they learn from one another as they learned, I hope something from me as well in the PLC. But um, as they learn from each other, they were learning best practices for teaching this, but they were also, they were stealing each other's kind of uh, celebrations. And so uh, because of COVID, we never got to do, we were going to do like a, not a blooper, but like a celebration 
um, video, but we never got a chance to do that. But they had some really cool, fun things. That's giving kids a feedback to like, hey, you did great. And now we're going to the next thing. And it's so engaging for kids. All right. Now, uh, we didn't get a chance to do a lesson ourselves, but honestly, I think it's so important that you have this knowledge. And I do want to tell you, of course, that you have all these videos uh, on the Patent YouTube channel and a link to them on the Padlet. So, of course, anything that we're teaching, we need to assess and look for. So these next few slides that you have are some look for. They're kind of like the canary in the coal mine. If you see kids um, exhibiting these behaviors, it's kind of a look for saying, oh, I better check into this a bit more. Here are the preschool look fors. Of course, we're looking at rhyming and this mispronouncing of familiar words. Um, K to one, you know, if they are making uh, reading errors, if they're coming to the first word and they're guessing, if they're not looking all the way through, we always want to ask our families: Is there, if they feel comfortable sharing, is there uh, anyone in the family that had reading challenges or dyslexia? Because we know that there is a familiar uh, component, a familial component to dyslexia. It doesn't mean you will be but more likely, right? And then here are our second grade and above look fors, all right? Um, these are some um, free um, phonological awareness surveys that I would just, uh, assessments I would encourage you to check out. Uh, really Great Reading does have a really nice phonological and phonemic awareness survey, it's free. Um, here are some of the uh, components that um, are focused on in kindergarten and um, above. David Kilpatrick has generously offered his phonemic awareness, uh, phonological awareness screening test. The past it has four forms. It's a diagnostic assessment that's going to tell you information as well as screen for issues. Um, that is absolutely free. And he has a website that, you know, it's on my Padlet that will, you know, direct you to how to do this. Right. So uh, when we have a universal screener that says, oh, there's an issue with phonological awareness, it's like you when you go to the doctors. They screen you. Unfortunately, they weigh me, <laughs> they check my temperature, and they do my blood pressure. That's a screener. But if they see, like, I have a high temperature, they're going to use a diagnostic. It's important to understand why the child is having problems with phonology or phonemic awareness, not just that they are. So diagnostics tell us why. And these are some resources to dig into the why. Um, a diagnostic screener for phonemic awareness, all right? And this is a norm reference one. Your school psychologist and your speech language pathologist likely has it. Now, on the Padlet <laughs> are so many free resources for you, all right? Uh, recently, I have had, unfortunately, people, I've been working on these Padlets for years. I have 92 of them. Some people have remade them and said they were their own completely. They completely remade them, put their name on everything. Is that? So I've had to... Um, move forward with some copyright and some, you know, asking people not to remake them. Uh, so I am gen generously sharing them with you. Everything on here is for free for you. You'll notice lots of um, videos to, you know, reinforce how to teach those speech sounds. Here's a link to all 26 videos that you can watch teachers engage in this phonemic awareness lesson. Um, this is a um, reading league uh, session that I did on phonemic awareness. If you want to check that out too, here's the Rollins Center, the wonderful video there too so many free resources for you to transfer this knowledge into practice when you go back to your classrooms all right i strongly recommend that you visit the university of florida literacy institute they have generously created many wonderful resources you can use whether you're face-to-face -face or virtual um, it is a must visit site um, so uh, we're not going to have time for that either too i'm sorry i i hope to be able to get to everything tonight um, there's never enough time when I'm with teachers, I have to say that. Um, there is so much gratitude in <laughs> I'm sorry, the I feel chat terrible. box for the, re the resources, um, oh, Dr. Kastner. So many thank yous. Thank you so much. So I'm sure you will notice your numbers go up. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to go up. Please do. I mean, that's why I've created all of them, and I've always shared everything I do free. I, I don't think that money should be a barrier to the science of reading. So... Everything I create, I create and share at no, you know, free. I want to. So I know this is a fast pace. Um, so I really encourage you to continue the conversation. If you like with me, please uh, email me. I am, uh, as, as Amy knows, and I think Shara does too, I am pretty uh, prolific on uh, Facebook and Twitter. I just can't help myself. I, I live, uh, besides my family, I live to help teachers and kids. So yes, you'll see me on Facebook and yes, you'll see me on Twitter. 
and it'll be literacy, 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 and boy, Lola, Layla, Leo, Lily, and Louie, and Daphne on Facebook too. So I thank you so much for your time. It's such a gift. Um, you have worked a long day, uh, been in you know, schools and classrooms and your family probably, you know, um, it's not missing dinner and they're definitely missing you. Um, I want to say how grateful I am that you spent this time uh, with me this evening. And I hope that someday uh, that we had a chance to meet face to face. Thank you so much for your time. Dr. Kastner, thank you so much for this evening. It was an absolute wonderful experience. Uh, I couldn't see I'm, anybody, so I'm glad I could see you now. <laughs> I do want to show you what I keep on my desk. Oh, yeah, the ropes. My ropes. Yeah. About a year ago, you gave me the website for my ropes. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. But we do want to thank you and thank you for sharing your knowledge on phonology and, and really how the development of phonemic awareness underpins a child's ability to read and spell. So um, okay. thank you so much. And we, we really do not have time for questions tonight. Um, I'm sorry. No, no. And, and we expected this. That's why we stopped along the way and, um, okay. <laughs> and presented questions. But, okay. I, but I will leave you with one question. Okay. Can, can children have delayed phonological awareness, but no delays in phonics? No. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're back to this, right? Yes, um, and we wanted to hear you say that yeah. and repeat that, that it's no. just phonological. Uh, here's what I want to say real quick, Amy. Sometimes we yeah. fool ourselves with practices that are not the best for wiring children's brains, and we give them flashcards, and we we think kids are reading and they are not, they are memorizing. And so we think, oh, you know, you know, I don't know why they're not good at phonological awareness and phonics is related. They're reading these words, but they're not reading those words. They've memorized those words. So remember. Yes. <laughs> speech yes. to print. So sorry. Yes. But no, and that was a question we had in the chat box, and I wanted you to reiterate the answer okay. to that. So thank you so much. And again, sure. thank you for tonight. We um, sure. really appreciate your time with our participants. Oh, no, thank you. I'm really, truly grateful and honored. Thank you all uh, for the Thank time. you. Yeah. So wonderful. <laughs> it, was, it was fun. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. All right, Cheryl, I'm going to turn it oh, over to you. Oh, there it is. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so mm -hmm. as promised, uh, <laughs> to learn more about the children's rights to read, we wanted to come back and share this information with you. Um, please visit the ILA website to pledge your support and to find it links uh, to resources such as the rights to an excellent literacy instruction, um, a manual on advocating for children's rights to read, um, and a one-page poster of the rights to read pledge to share with your colleagues. But most importantly, on this page you can find an um, a area where you can add your name uh, to support this crucial cause for literacy for all.